Welcome to Global Perspectives. Can you imagine being enslaved? Abolitionist Francis Buck doesn't have to imagine. It was his reality for 10 years. Global Perspectives with Pulitzer Prize winning commentator, John Bercia. Welcome to the show, Francis. Thank you, John. Thank you for being here. Thank you for your return visit uh, to our show. Uh, it's always a pleasure to have you. For those who may have not had the opportunity to see you before, why don't we go back to the beginning? Tell us, tell us what it was like on that day that you suddenly found yourself enslaved. Well, thank you once again for having me be back here. It's always a pleasure and an honor for me to be here as a victim and to have this great opportunity to revisit uh, my, I call, horrible story of survival. Uh, today, the perpetrators who happened to take my childhood away, then at age of seven to 17 years in captivity, continues in other part of the world to practice what I call inhuman practices that should be once and for all abolish it and eradicate it. No man, no woman, no child deserved to be a property of another man. In 1986, I became a victim of slavery at age of seven years old. Ten years in captivity was a great nightmare for me. Thinking about the love of my family, thinking about the beautiful land and village that I used to live in, in Gorion, in southern Sudan then. Thinking about my siblings, a father and a mother, whom I parted, waving at them, getting the final, that I thought, the final hug and smile from my mother, whom I never seen again, after sending me off to a local market to sell eggs and peanuts. And the reason you didn't see them again was because they were killed shortly. The after. reason I didn't see them again because soon I left, or we left our village. Our village was actually invaded, completely distracted. Men and women were killed. Livestock were taken, cattle and others. Young men and women were rounded up and taken as slaves. The same militia men who are Arabs Baghdadar. For those who are familiar with the issue of Darfur today would actually know the people that I'm talking about. They call them Jinjawit, men on horseback. And these people get the permission from the government of Sudan to go and raid villages in South Sudan then. And sometimes they even use the Darfurians that they have now turned against them in 2003 to the, to the date. So my village was raided by these people, and they came and raided also the marketplace where I was sent to, and we were taken to up to the north of Sudan as a gift or a property to those who came and did all the destruction that they have done, including burning down the villages killing the men that are physically, and even women that are resisting to go with them, and rounding up young men and young women. And when I talk young men and young women from five to you name it afterwards, and I was among the kids that were actually taken to slavery. So when you actually arrived at your destination, what was the situation there? How, how were you treated? And what did you think the next day? Could you imagine that you were going to be in that environment for a decade? Well, the situation, uh, when I first arrived into the farm in a place called Kerio in North Sudan, my first welcome, the impression that I have actually experienced was that the family was standing there, the wife and her children, some other family members, everyone was shouting a beat, a beat. I didn't know what that a beat means. I have no idea. I thought maybe something good, but absolutely not. A beat means slave. 
that was the word that I was hearing. The next thing that I had experienced was the kids coming towards me, laughing, touching me, slapping me, spitting on me, and peeing on me. And I was asking myself, I began asking myself a lot of questions. Why? What is my guilt? Why am I here? And why are these people treating me in such a way? Who are these people? I didn't know who they were. I have no idea. I don't speak the language. The only language I know is my native language, Dinka. I don't speak Arabic then. The media question that I have formed based on the impression of what I have seen when I was welcome. The next things following that, bidding, and all the other things that were done to me is being isolated from the people, being next to the animals. And I felt that I was completely separated from the humans and being next to the animals, being fed a different food, having my different plate where I can eat on. And, and that continues for a longer time until I realized I was in the wrong place with the wrong family. I knew these people were human beings. But what troubled me at the time is how they have turned to treat me. What made them so uh, hateful to even treat a young man who was only seven years old in a way they were treating me. Well, I, I know we'll never be able to answer that question, especially during the short time we have on the show. But more importantly, what was the effect on you when you realized that you were in this place and you couldn't escape? What, what were your thoughts? Were, did you panic? Did you resign yourself to the fact that you were going to be there for, for quite some time? I actually, um, this is something that I have fought and I have fought it a real fight and fight that have lead into my success. And that is I never gave up. I never gave up inside me. I always say I have a dream. I want to see my family again. And I want to be somebody someday. So I always turn my heart to God, praying, saying, God, please save me, protect me. Help, you know, guide me and deliver me one day so I can reunite with my family and people that loves me. So these were the things that I was going through. I have attempted, of course, to skip seven years after I turned age of 14 years old. And I said, I'm gonna to try to skip. But of course, when I was brought into that area, I didn't know anywhere and I didn't know anybody. So imagine living, not only not knowing the road where you're going to, where lead you to a certain place, but running in the forest. And I was captured back and taken to the same people. I was beaten and I was threatened not to attempt again. But in my heart, I said I'd rather die than be slaved because I hate the way they treat me and the way they treat other slaves. So I waited for another two days and I skipped the second attempt. On my second attempt, I was captured and I thought that was going to be the end of my life. So you were actually attached by a rope or some other device to the horse, so you were on the ground. Yes, and uh, he has a rifle telling me today it's gonna to be your last day on the earth. While he was standing in front of me and swearing to kill me, and his wife actually moving around saying, what are you waiting for? Kill him, just like a chicken. I just bent my head and I said, God, don't, don't let him kill me. I love my family. I want to leave and I want to be free again. He left me tied up until several hours later, he came and released me with the condition not to attempt again. And I thought I would be, I will not be normal anymore to walk normally. Yes, I sustained some scars on my legs, 
after being tied up for quite too long. But I thank God for actually touching his heart not to kill me. That's the time I waited for extra three more years until when I at the age of 17 in 1996, I finally skipped. Knowing that the risk is high, but whatever the consequence is, I'm ready to fight. So I skipped until I made my way to the capital of Sudan, where I would help again to make my way to Egypt as a refugee there. And finally, um, got my refugee status to come to America. So tell, tell us about the day you arrived in the United States. What, what did you think? This was a new country. Again, you didn't speak the language, and you were exposed to a whole array of experiences you would probably never imagine. America is a great place. I did not knew anything about America when I was in Egypt. I don't even know the map of America. Leave alone Fargo, North Dakota, where I was resettled to. I was there in August of 1999, not knowing anybody, not knowing the language, trying to learn many things. And I remember it during the snow, I go out using my bicycle. I want to learn how to ride the bicycle. And I see people laughing and I have no idea what they laugh because they see me falling down, doing funny things. But I was trying just to catch up, things that I didn't actually have or didn't do or already passed me. I was extremely excited. When I was actually taken to my apartment and given a short tour by the caseworker who was working with Lutheran Social Services, an organization that brought me uh, I retook a tour of myself again, and I stretched my arm very high, and I took a deep breath, and I said, now I'm a free man. I have my own place, and nobody will ever again intimidate me. I can sleep now as much as I want, because I never had enough sleep when, all the years that I, when I was in slavery. Because I'm the first one to walk up and the last one to go to bed, walking from sun up to sundown. But in that moment after I entered into my apartment in Fargo, North Dakota, I said, what is worth my freedom? If my people are still dying, what is worth my freedom if my people are still in captivity? So I promised myself that I hope one day I will do something that will help these men and women who are still held in bondage. And only country that I knew then was my country, Sudan. I thought that's where only horrible things happening. I little, later learned about other countries. There are 27 million people that are still held in bondage globally. And the form of actually slavery and human trafficking, these were the words that I had to learn later and made my mind even more bigger and brought me to conclusion, what are we waiting for? What are our leaders are doing about this? So I had to step up and I have to make my voice heard by speaking on behalf of my own and on behalf of millions who cannot speak for themselves, whether the Sudanese or any other human beings. So you settled in Fargo, North Dakota. You then subsequently lived in a few other states. You ended up in, in, in Boston, yes. working with people in the anti-slavery movement. Yes. What was that experience like? What was, it, what was the experience for you as you learned English and you began to talk to audiences about what had happened to you? It was difficult, and it's still difficult, um, just to talk about horrible things that happen to you in your life. I know some people used to ask me, are you not shy to talk about these things? You being sent to the market to sell eggs and peanuts. Are you not being ch shy about things that happen to you in the treatment? And I said, why should I be shy? That's what exactly what took away my freedom. That's what happened to me. If I can't tell it, how would you know? How would someone else know? 
And if I can't talk about it, that means I'm encouraging it. It will happen to some other young man or woman, whether in my former country or anywhere, country, any other countries. So basically, I joined that organization um, with appreciation of what I saw that they were doing greatly, that they were giving platform to the victims like myself to go and speak at schools, from high school, colleges, and universities across the U.S and other part of the world, spreading awareness about modern day slavery, a genocidal, a human trafficking, things that need to be brought to an end. And to me, what's, what's most shocking about this is you didn't experience just one calamity, you experienced multiple calamities, because a lot of times people have natural disasters that occur to them, crimes and so forth, but you were taken into slavery, you were removed from your home, from your village, you were deprived of your freedom. In a broader sense, you were deprived of the opportunity between the ages of 7 and 17 is typically when most young people gain an education, some preliminary experience about life. You didn't have any of that. So you experienced multiple calamities because of, of slavery. And then at age 17, 18, instead of being ready to graduate from high school and go on to college or something, you were in a very, very different place. You were already working in the abolitionist movement because yes. that was the immediate priority. That's what I was taught to do. Um, I was not given an opportunity to go to school. Uh, of course, even when I was still with my parents, my parents didn't have ability to take me to school from that age five to or eight, three, two, seven, before I was taken to slavery. Leave alone the 10 years that I have spent in slavery, I never had a formal education. So even after I came here, the only thing in my mind, and I was so much thrilled, that I was getting a job that I'm getting paid for. Because the job I have done from last, from age seven to 17 and 18 was not a paid job. I was working for free under threat of violence to serving someone else, mm -hmm. making someone else happy, but not me, not my family, not my community, but someone else to be happy. So basically, I didn't have that opportunity. And the reason I came and joined the anti-slavery movement because I felt that there's no time for me to wait. I felt that the whole world didn't do enough to allow me to stay for a good 10 years, to allow my people being taken to slavery, and even brainwash young children to be completely brainwashed and change their religion, change everything, change their names. These kids would remain there forever. So that's the reason that I felt that there's a need for me to speak out. So once I go for prevention, Nothing like that happened again to anybody, anywhere in the world. Second, to ensure that those who are in captivity now are being released, been given their freedom back. God created all of us equal. And we have our own God-giving rights, basic rights, that everyone should practice, freedom. Uh, and finally, to urge our governments whether our government here or any government in the world, and the United Nations, to make this as another law, as a crime, to punish it, to bring all the perpetrators into justice, and to stop trafficking young men and women in the trick that you will come and have a better life, and you ending up taking away your documents, putting you in the basement or somewhere else, doing things they shouldn't be doing under threat of violence, that if you attempt to do this, they will kill you or your parents. These are the form of human trafficking today. Leave alone as a sex slavery. That when I was coming from Africa, passing, connecting through Dubai in United Emirates, in late, of in late of 2016, I met two 
African girls. I was just buying water in one of the shop there, and they were just standing there. And I asked them what country they're traveling to. I thought they were coming to Europe. And they said, we live here. We are working here. And I asked them what, what country they're from in Africa. One is from Liberia, and the other one's from Nigeria. And these are young girls, 20-something of age. I asked them if they came with their family there, and they just said, us, and we've been here for a few years, we're still looking for a job. And I was thinking, what kind of job would this single young girl who would be doing there? Something wrong. And I assumed they were actually smuggled there by somebody else. They are traffickers. And what job they may be doing in a dirty job. And why would such a young girl end up being alone in a foreign country doing the job that she shouldn't be doing? And why would the government of that particular country or their own original countries where they came from, should it prevent that? So these are, so human trafficking is not something of the past, nor does slavery something of the past, as people think in the United States ended in 1865, a couple hundred years ago. Slavery still exists in its form and its ugly form and shape. And I just described some, how it happened, and it's something that needs all of us to fight it, whether you in the government, private sector, whether you a vulnerable person, all of us, what, what it takes to make a difference. Help us understand what exactly we should be doing. We, I, I think we see what the role of government ought to be as far as creating the national policies, working with other governments around the world to coordinate an effort against human trafficking. But what can people do at other levels? What can people do at the community level? What can they do at the individual level? And how important is education in all of this? Well, the first thing, you have to shed light. You have to recognize it is actually existing. It is actually alive. It is even in our own backyard sometimes. And what the UCF and global perspective and the community here in Central Florida and all the state of Florida, what you are doing is unique and this is what the victims, those who are still yet freed and those who are freed, they appreciate what you're doing because first you're giving the victim a platform to speak. I'm sure people will watch what this, this interview there. And I'm sure people will listen and appeal to them. If they really want to do something, they will go out and speak in the community, making awareness, fighting along with those who have already picked up the fight. So there's awareness needed to be met, recognition need to be given to this because this is something that is there. And anybody that tolerating it, anyone that accepting this practice, if you are not serving our wall. You are not serving our humanity. You are absolute dangerous to our humanity. You must fight against it. You must allow these men and women to be free human beings like any of us. They have a dream like us. They want to go to school. Today, I'm 38 years old, and I have a dream. I want to go back to school. I want to accomplish something. I want to be a leader. I want to be and I want to be. Many things. So the same dreams are being suppressed and oppressed and marginalized for those who do not have a freedom yet, or those who still fall into becoming a victim like me. So it takes one man step so more could follow along. So I appreciate the role that being uh, played by this uh, great uh, entity at the University of Central Florida, uh, Global Perspective and Human Trafficking. Um, so this is something that we need to support and we need to appreciate, the community need to come and support it, the government need to support it. Okay, well thank you, Francis. Um, just so you know, you already are a leader. I think that has been clear from this conversation and from the other work that you've done. You were victimized by slavery, but you're a survivor and you are sharing your experience and you're working 
in a very, very noble fashion to end this problem in the world today. So we want to thank you very much for appearing on the show. Thank you very much. I'm honored to be here. And thank you. For Global Perspectives, I'm John Bercia, and we'll see you next time.